All right. Good morning. I'll wait a minute just to make sure it comes through. Good morning. Um, this is I'm Samantha Mirabal, and I'm with the Melco's application team. This is our design shop talk. Um, we're trying to do these on a weekly basis to answer your questions about design shop or pretty much whatever you want to talk about. Um, so if you have questions, be sure you either send them in um, to the applications team or we usually post these a few days before the event um, before Friday so if you have questions type them in ahead of time and we'll try to get some answers for you all right so I'll start off with hopefully can anyone see or hear me let's see um, all right oh good morning excellent so I can see comments so look good all right so we'll start off with some of the questions um, only had a few all right so one of them was how do we get good morning how do we get melco to auto detect um colors on an image you did oh without auto digitizing i don't know the only way i know to do it is through auto digitizing um so unfortunately that's not the easy the best solution but it works so just for those who aren't aware of how that works is let's say i've got an image and i select the image up here, I'm just going to tell it to quick auto to digitize and say convert to embroidery. So from here, I can say OK and poof, I have embroidery. In a moment, I will anyway. There we go. Now I have embroidery. All right. So if I turn off the image, you'll see it. There we go. One thing you'll notice is the colors it selected are all are. RGBs um, values they're not thread colors so what you can do to have it auto match them for you to an actual thread chart is well you can do it one at a time which is a little bit obnoxious I can double click on these I can go to colors and say match chart okay and that will match the single chart or over here with all my thread colors if I right click there and go to edit color I can say match chart and apply and notice it matched all of them for me at once so I didn't have to go through and one at a time choose them so that's one way you can do it yeah I'm sorry um, but that's the only way I know how to I'll ask the guys they're at the show today so I'll see if there's any other way but the only ways I know to do it are over here when it's in RGB's to right click go to the colors say it match and then it will pick the thread colors okay so I'll see if I'm missing something, but I don't think so. So I believe that's the only way to do that. All right, so another question we had was how do you do this? Well, I from this, I can't quite tell what it is. I believe it's just a concentric fill. Um, Design Shop doesn't have a concentric fill per se. So how you would do that, I made a few examples just to walk through. Um, let's see here. This is what I did. I did a few different ones and I'll actually do them again for you just so you can see. Hi there. All right. So it's quite the mess in here because I was doing all kinds of things to be able to show you different examples. All right. So let's start off with first off, what type of stitch is that? I think it's a chain stitch. Honestly, I'm not quite sure. I assumed it was one. So what I did was created my own little chain stitch right here. So I found just an image, something for me to trace figured out how I wanted it to lat, and then used my manual stitch here to create this shape. Okay, so that it started on this point, it ended here, so that when it does the repeat, it'll create my um, repeating pattern for me. So once I used my manual, I made sure the stitch, um, the distance between needle penetrations wasn't going to be too close, so that I actually got a decent stitch length. So from there, I took this thing that I drew, selected it right click went to save custom shape good morning and um, said decorative I always do this as test until I decide whether I like it or not and then I'll save it off as my final so I keep on overwriting the same one so change it to test and decorative say okay say yes I want to replace it and then I test it out by doing this I come draw a line set it to test and now I can draw that to create my stitch see if I like it um, make changes to it and whatnot so I created that thing now to get this like I said there is no concentric fill 
So what you have to do is, see what I did here? I drew a whole bunch of lines all over the place. That's what you have to do to create it. All right, so to give me some guidelines so that my lines were parallel, all I did was this. I'm gonna turn all this mess off. And let me turn that off. All right, so I started with this, so let's just do it again. All right, so to create that, I drew the letter M. It's my last name, so I keep on picking M. So I changed it to a century font. Century, hello. All right, and then I made it bigger. There we go. All right, and then I just converted it to a vector. Convert to vector. There, now I have a shape. So from here, what I want is some guidelines that are, you know, at even spaces through here so that as I'm tracing, you know, I'm not just eyeballing the distance. All right. So to do that, I copied and pasted. I just changed the color because I like seeing the different colors so I can actually make sure it's doing what I expect. Over here, you have an offset outline and it can be positive or negative numbers. I just did negative 20 points. And now I have 20 points in. Copy, paste, and again, I just keep changing the colors so I can see it. Right click, offset, off outline, minus 20. So you can see it's creating lines I can trace now that are 20 points in. You can also duplicate if you're not familiar with duplicate right here. So you can duplicate it. And again, the other way you can do offset is under operations. So if you right click on the element operations, do offset outline, minus 20, and so on and so forth. All right, so I've got a start of that anyway. Okay. Um, oh, snowstorm in Manitoba. Ooh, I'm in Florida. It's nice and hot here. All right, so now what do we do to create that kind of chain fill through there? Well, I'm going to zoom in here. I'm going to go to my walk input, set it to my test decorative, and now I'm just going to trace. So I'm going to start. Where do I want to start? I don't know. Let's start here. All right. To keep the line horizontal, remember you can hold um, adding that shape to a fill. I'll show you what that does in a minute. It gives, so there's a question, um, what about adding that shape to a fill? Maybe it could give a similar look. Uh, kind of. You can mess with the stitch directions, and I'll show you what that does, because I actually did that as, as one of the examples in this file. Um, it's difficult. So if you want the cleanest with the less amount of just fighting with stitch directions, this is usually the easiest way, I think, anyway. Um, but you would just trace around your shape, hold alternate to keep your lines horizontal or vertical. Oh, way too cold. Yeah, I'm in Florida. It's nice and hot. We just did a, turned on our PV system at the house, which is awesome. Anyway, that's photovoltaic, so we're producing power now. That's cool. All right. So once we get down here, so I'm back to the start. I don't want to reconnect to that first starting point. I want to go to my next row because I want this to be concentric. So now I'm going to run around on the inner one. So you just keep on working your way around it. These lines, oops, did I, I just crossed across my lines. Now yeah, I'm going to do that anyway. So I just draw these vectors here just to have something to trace. Um, you can see it's a little bit odd of how it went around the corner, so I'm eyeballing it a little bit off, but that's all right. So you trace around until you get the look you want. Um, I know there's, and if you have a Illustrator or any of those softwares, you can create that concentric pattern that you have it easy, easier to do rather than what I just did here to be doing using the offset. But this is one way you could do it. Trace around, and then when you're done, I'll do just this last line, and all I'm doing is left clicking around the shape. Now again, instead of going here, I go to my next line and trace over. All right, so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to hit enter. And you can see it created that kind of concentric fill. Okay. And if I turn off all the vectors, it's easier to see. All right, this line I should probably bring down. So that's one way we could do that. 
Um, so there was another question or suggestion of what if we do it as a fill, which is what this mess over here is. So if I turn off my, there. So this here is doing a, digit, a decorative fill. All right, so I took the same shape and I change, if I go into the properties of the fill, all right, so why don't I do it so you can see how rather than me waving my hands around. All right, so I'm going to take the M that we started with. Zoom to that. All right, so if I change that to a fill, there, we've got a fill. Well, now I can go into the properties and change it to a decorative fill. Now with the decoratives, you can apply whatever pattern you want to it. It's kind of fun. So that test pattern that I had, I can set it to test. And you'll see it gives, you know, a look like this, which isn't bad, but if you're trying to go for that concentric, it's not exact, right? So what you can do at this point is now play with stitch directions. So if I delete this, straight stitch direction, and now I'm gonna go add a curved one. Oops, let's back that up. Let's start here. So let's try this. I'm just going to go down the middle, trace through here, and see what we get. Mm, let's do it like that. All right. And not quite it, right? So this, like I said, you can play with this for quite a while and eventually get something that looks decent. And that's what I did here. I just kept on playing with it until I got the stitch direction to lay down in the way so this one I ended up doing straight stitch directions across each of these regions so rather than using the curved and that's how I got it to kind of flow around so just to show you that up here rather than using the curved so if I delete that stitch direction I just drew in there and now I'll come and add a straight stitch direction there one there one there you can see it's kind of fanning around not quite the same look as that original picture, but um, it's a, just a different technique you can play with, right? Okay, so those are kind of two different ways you do it. Either trace it out yourself using a straight stitch, a decorative, whatever. You can apply a pattern straight to the fill, but um, doing a true edge fill, there is one that you can always play with. It usually ends up right there. So if I change that to an edge fill, now it's filling along the edges. But notice over here, it does weird things. So it takes a lot of work to get the, um, the that pattern to work when you have small, tight corners like this. All right. Let's see, what else do we have? Can you add fast clamps as a hoop and design shop? Absolutely. All right. So it kind of depends on where your hoop database is. So we've got a few options. So if we go to the website, oh, my screen's not set up to be able to do that. Hang on one second. I think if I put it on the screen, it'll show up, maybe. No. Please work. There. Okay. So if I go to milco-service.com, click on the fast clamps. Down here, you have a hoop installation program. All right. So depending on how you have your software installed, um, you'll have that MD, the hoop database file that it'll install for the software for you. Um, there is a manual way to do it. I usually just do that because um, and here you'll see if needed, you can manually update it. So depending on where you have your software installed, you may have a common database or you might have separate databases for the different um, softwares. All right. So me, I have separate databases all over the place just because I install my software weird. So if I go into where it's all start, you can see all the different versions. I just keep on making new folders to install it. So in here, it's MDB, I think. Maybe? MBD? I should have looked up the hoop database first. Anyway, there's the hoop databases in here somewhere. Let's see, system. And of course, now I'm going to fumble in front of everyone. <laughs> uh, it's on the, um, the web page. Sorry, I should have looked it up beforehand. But 
there's a common database and then there's uh, that's shared between the different the OS and the design shop if it shows up in design shop and not in the other you'll need to copy the hoop database over or add the hoop straight to design shop and it will create that same database over there hi there so I didn't get a whole lot of questions for this week so what other questions do you have got lots of nice weather it looks like bright and sunny in some places. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, it's nice here. I hate the cold, so it's living in Florida. <laughs> All right, so what other questions do we have? Does anyone have anything for me? Maybe, maybe not. I'm looking over on the screen. Well, I know there's um, different trade shows going on. A lot of the guys are over there at that. So if you're in, I think it's in Denver. Yeah, the Denver and, um, NBM show. So you can always go check it out. There's lots of people there to chat with, showing off the equipment. They've got all kinds of things to look at and talk to. Um, I think that's all I had, unless you guys have more questions. I'll wait a moment or two more, see if any pop up. Puckering. Okay, puckering on what? So puckering in general, you've got a few things that you can use or address with that. One, let me go to this. All right, hoop MDB. There you go. Thank you for putting that in <laughs> for me. All right, so the how to move the common file over so it'll work on both of them is there. Okay, so for puckering, um, you got a few different things to consider. One is your digitizing, another is your hooping, right? So the hooping, you want to make sure everything's taut, not, not stretched. If you stretch your fabric, right? So if you overstretch it, hoop it, and sew it, when you release it, the very first thing that it's going to do is it's going to shrink back up, right? So you'll end up inducing problems by overstretching it. So you want to make sure it's flat but not overly stretched. So that's one is make sure you hoop right. Make sure you use good stabilizer. If you're not stabilizing around, right, it's not gonna hold still, right? So if things are moving around when you're going to sew, well, that's when the, mo the motion is what causes the puckers and the kind of inconsistencies that you see in the digitizing or in the sew outs, right? So by making it hold still with good hooping, with good stabilizers, that's half of it. The other half is looking at your um, digitizing and make sure it's appropriate for your application. Things that you can assess is, you know, do you have enough underlay or the appropriate underlay? You know, there is such a thing as too much, right? Um, if you've got, if you don't have the edges secured, can you buy only the softwares? Yes, you can only buy the softwares. So, um, yeah, you can talk to a sales agent and I'm sure they'd be happy to sell you stuff. <laughs> um, let's see, there was another question and then I'll get back to this. DS seems to quit in the middle of doing any time of changes to design. Is this a common problem? Uh, not for me. Um, it really depends on your computer. If you, I run on a gaming laptop and I find that if I have, it's a graphics intensive program. So by having um, a, a computer that has a graphics card that has onboard dedicated graphic RAM, so by doing that, it allows it to take that processing off the computer and it just, it seems to run much more stable. I had all sorts of issues until I got an appropriate um, computer that had the right graphics card on it. Um, back to my puck ring real quick and then we'll look at that. All right, so the underlay. So the name of embroidery is hold it still, right? So if I have underlay on this shape here and I, all I did was a center run down the center, is that giving me any stabilization on where the edge of this is? No, right? So as things move, you're able to move more because you're not tacking the fabric and your stabilizer together before you go in with your top stitching. So you want to make sure you have underlay on things in an appropriate amount. And what I mean by that is on performance wear, if you overdo the um, sewing, so if you put so many stitches in there, um, heavy underlay, heavy, you know, lots of density on the, the sew outs, you're going to end up causing problems um, because it's just too much for the fabric. It moves it around too much and you'll start giving problems. So it's kind of a balance between there. 
Um, there are also many new stabilizers out there. I also use non-gumming temporary adhesive. Yeah, Madeira has a wealth of information. That's very true. So I've got, um, they have that new cut performance, which works really nicely. Um, the 505, particularly when you have either, the 505 is a Odif product. There also is a good old K1, uh, K100. There's a whole bunch of different um, stabilizers or uh, spray adhesives, but that will tack your fabric to the stabilizer to, again, help prevent the motion that caught that's um, resulting in the um, puckering. All right. I have not started digitizing yet. Can you suggest where, and then there's also a question before it leaves. Someone was asking about jump stitches in one of the Melco groups. Could I go over that? Sure, I didn't see that question, but let me add it to my list before I, it leaves the screen and I forget it. Um, okay, I haven't started digit digitizing yet. Where do I start? All right, this is what I'd suggest. Come to melcouniversity.com. Um, All right, over here, there's a media tab. Click on it. Right here are the basic videos. I would start at the top and work your way straight down to the bottom. Um, the first four kind of, uh, the basics, lettering, object properties, and editing are really getting you comfortable with Design Shop, um, working, you know, working with other people's things, essentially. All right, understanding the properties, the underlay, um, what settings make for good sew outs, things like that. So, and it shows you how to do the lettering. So that's the first four. Then I would go into the digitizing. That's where you learn how to bring in your art, start from scratch, and really, you know, again, and Jaship was saying to look at the columns, um, tracing letters, columns one and two. You know, that's a good place. I would start with a walk element so you can get the hang of left click, right click. There's some exercises you can do. Um, there's plenty of art in the your shared drive. So if you come over here, if you go to the C drive, when it installs, there's this design folder. If you open that up, there's this graphics folder. In here, there's lots of things you can practice with. Um, some of the ones I like to show everyone is this one. Uh, let me put it into this. Good ones to practice, um, left click, right click would be these, your TP or the sun and moon. Um, I know we did this one as a Facebook Live once, so you can actually find it over on YouTube to be able to trace through it. But once you get the hang of left click, right click, that carries into all the other digitizing tools. So you would then go learn your column one, your column two, your columns or your satin stitches. Once you get that, fills are simple. There's a whole lot you can do with fills. Um, so, but literally start at the top and work your way down is where I would suggest. Okay. All of those are, if you have issues with this, all of them are also on YouTube. So if you go to Melco's YouTube channel, you can get these same videos. I just like this because they're all in order and easy to follow. Okay. Someone's asking about jump stitches. Could I go over? Like I said, I don't know what the question was, but I'll show you jump stitches. So up here, we've got our walk input. All right, so that's how we input lines. So if you draw that, you know, whatever shape you draw, um, and when it's not a decorative, it'll just be a walk input. All right, so a walk input is your stitches from one point to the next, needle penetrations, at whatever um, distance from needle penetration to needle penetration you specify as your stitch length. All right, so that's your walk normal. If you hold that button down, you'll see there's a vector line. There's also your manual, but let's stay with this walk normal. Up here, you'll see if I do this drop down, I can make it a bean stitch or a jump, a decorative or sequin. All right, a bean, a, the walk is a single needle penetration, a single piece of thread from location to location. Well, if I change it to bean, that's three stitches at each location. Well, if my bean stitch thickness is set to three. All right, so that'll be one, two, three, forward, back, forward. So there's three pieces of thread at every location. Well, if I go to seven, all right, forward, back, forward, back, uh, back and forth until I get seven pieces. Now, to create a jump stitch, what you would do is you would select your walk input, change this to jump. Your first click, that's going to be a needle penetration. Your second click will be a needle penetration. So you're essentially deciding where you want it to go stitch. It's, and you'll notice if I turn it off a 3D mode, 
all have those dotted lines that are dragged, that, that are drug around. All right, those are your jump stitches. Um, I personally don't use them. I don't like them much because I'm just going to go get my scissors out and trim them, and I'd rather my machine do that. <laughs> so I don't use them a whole lot, but you can. There are applications where it makes sense, like if you're doing eyeballs and you've on a, a face, let's say, and you've got cartoon eyeballs, tiny little black dot next to a black dot. Well, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to sew one, tie off the knot, do the trim, move it over, hardly anything at all, and go again. Well, you can just put a jump stitch in and keep going. Um, and trim it out, or maybe even leave it if it's not visible. Um, let's see. Oh, I put a question up here that went away. Okay, that was that. Um, I did make this just because I thought it was cool, and I figure I'll show it to you in case you guys don't know about it. It's fun. So let's say I want to add something similar to these. Oh, that's all right, Cheryl. They're recorded, so you can watch it again later. All right, so let's say I've got a fill, and I want to add stamps to it like this. All right, so how do I do that? All right, well, first off, I'm just going to go make, again, I'm going to make a letter M. I'll do lower, yeah, let's do lowercase this time so you can see the difference. All right, so if I just draw whatever, it can be any shape. I just used a letter because it's fast. Um, if you've got a design shape, you can use that. Whatever, I'm going to copy that into my clipboard. Use Control C is what I usually do. I just right click and went to copy here. Now it's in my clipboard. So here, I'm going to select my fill. You always have to select what you want to edit first. And then if I hold down this fill button, or the insert hole, I can come over here to insert fill island. All right. Well, on top of fill island, down here where I put automatic custom shape input, if I hold that down, I can say clipboard shape. Aha, what does that do? Now watch. Now I can left click and drag, and now I've got a stamp of whatever shape I had in my clipboard stamped onto this. All right, so what else can I do with that? Well, if I select the shape, then select the hole, you'll note it, or the fill island, it puts a box around it. Now I can right click on that and go to properties, and you'll see that I've got different things I can do. So what if instead of this corduroy type pattern on here, what if I want to make that like Let's say I put it on that. I've got auto apply on. Well, now I get a basket weave effect. Okay, so I can give a basket weave effect. Or I can do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1. There we go. And apply that one or get a zigzag through there. So you can play with these um, the, the partitions and the different numbers on there to get different fill effects through there. So it's just a lot of fun. So you can make stamps and then you can play with it to get different effects through there. Okay, and like I said, I did it with a letter just because it's quick. You can draw any shape you want and do it. In fact, I bet if I move this one over, let's do it again. This time I'm going to say fill island. Instead of clipboard, I'm going to say select automatic input shape. Let's go, I don't know. I don't like any of these shapes. Let's see what shape should we do. Eh, I haven't tried it. Key? All right, does that work? Hey, look at that, it did it. So I put a key, the key shape in there. So anyhow, you can do all kinds of things. Oh, I didn't add a stitch direction to it, so now I've got a key shape that's, you can't tell. <laughs> anyhow, all right, what other questions do we have? Any, I don't see any typed in, so. All right, no problem, Judy. Well, I hope this was helpful for y'all. Remember, you know, sending your questions. Um, we'll, you can send them to applications at melco.com. You can type them in on any of these. I try to review the last two weeks worth of um, videos, the comments under it, so that if anyone typed in a question late, I can add it to the next week's one. So, um, you know, on this week's, if you think of stuff after the fact, add it, and I'll, you know, add that to next week's discussion. All right. 
Well, if I don't, if there are no other questions, I guess I'll head off and talk to you guys next week. Anything? All right. Well, cool. Um, 